evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening for our first in-person program at the History Center since February 2020, which I can tell you is very exciting. Too excited. All right. Um, my name is Alexander Schneider. I'm the manager of public programs here at the History Center, and I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to not have to explain Zoom to you this evening. <laughs> Um, and instead just dive right into our program. Um, I do, however, want to say a quick but very sincere thank you to David Forlow for supporting the recording of tonight's program. Um, and also just direct your attention to the foyer after the program. We have a list of upcoming events, and I hope you'll be able to check that out and join us again very soon in the future. Um, for now, though, I'm thrilled to introduce Nancy Snyder, Angela Graham, and John Comer, who will be sharing their knowledge and experience of the Chicago Yacht Club Race to Mackinac this evening. Nancy Snyder has been racing sailboats since she was six years old, when she was the light air crew on her brother's ex-boat on Pewaukee Lake, Wisconsin. <coughs> Nancy grew up sailing on inland lakes in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Texas, mostly on scows of all sizes. In her college years, Nancy founded the sailing team at Southern Methodist University in Dallas and raced in the collegiate circuit in the South and Southwest. Upon moving to Chicago in the early 1990s, Nancy has mainly raced Tartan Tens, a 34-foot racing sailboat. I learned a lot in this uh, preparation for the of sailing terminology. Um, she was co-owner and helms person of Waterworks and Chief Thrill. Nancy has completed 30 CYC races to Mackinac, 27 of them in a T10. She has finished on the podium 19 times, including nine section wins, which led to a second overall and a third overall. In addition to racing, Nancy has cruised in Croatia, Holland, Turkey, Greece, the Caribbean, and around the United States. When not sailing, Nancy owns an interior design firm, Bomb Breeze Design, and prior to this, Nancy worked at J.P. Morgan and its predecessors in development for alternative investments. Angela Graham started sailing after college and will complete her 33rd race to Mackinac this year. She has raced on boats ranging from 36 to 70 with numerous podium finishes and an overall fleet win in 2018. She is the Commodore of the Island of Goats Sailing Society, or Chief Goat Herder, having served on the board and flag of IGSS for the past six years. She is the second woman to be Commodore since IGSS was established in 1959. Angela has done most of her racing on the Great Lakes, including eight, or way too many in her words, Port Huron to Mackinac races. She has also raced <laughs> on the West Coast, including the 1,000-mile race from Newport Beach, California, to Puerto Vallarta, and spent two years in the Caribbean working as a deckhand on an 85-foot cutter-rigged catch. Angela hopes eventually to retire one of these days and spend more time with her powerboat in Michigan, but in the meantime, she is a senior director of the project management office for HCL Technologies. And finally, Jan Cromer learned to sail after a professional move brought her to Chicago. She has completed 29 CYC races to Mackinac with 17 podium finishes, including nine section wins and a first, second, third, and fourth overall. She has also participated in a number of regattas around the country, cruised the Caribbean and Great Lakes, and has sailed the Atlantic from the Azores to Portugal. Jen is a retired finance professional and served as a director and officer of the Chicago Yacht Club. All of the extraordinary women we have here have also been part of the MAC committee, which is the volunteer committee at Chicago Yacht Club that organizes the race each year. Um, a quick show of hands, how many of you were here for the 2018 program on the MAC race? Oh great, quite a few of you. So today you might hear some familiar stories, but you're also going to learn a lot of new information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers and ask you to help me to welcome Nancy, Angela, and Jan. Well, the race has been going on for a very long time, and this year marks the 112th running and the 123rd anniversary of the first race. Um, um, every year we, rate, we leave from Chicago and, and head up Kitty Corner, up the, up the lake. Um, most of the races have all gone to Mackinac Island, with a few exceptions that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the first race started in 1898 
with a mere five boats. Chicago Yacht Club's race to Mackinac has evolved into a world-class sporting event with over 300 boats. And over its 123 years, much has changed about this race, but many things have not changed. So in any given year, it can be freezing cold or burning hot. Uh, it can be calm doldrums or unbelievably windy. And it can be um, exhilarating or exhausting. Uh, all, or everything at once. The race has an incredibly special place in the hearts of those who have done the race. Um, and we keep coming back. I, I kid about the Island Goats that we just weren't smart enough to stop. Um, but it, very addictive. We look at those pictures of the island and we want to be back there every year. It's on the bucket list of many sailors all over the globe. Um, and it, it's an incredibly special destination. It is. So tonight we're going to tell you um, a bit about the history of the race, and we'll tell you a bit about the preparation that we do of boat and crew prior to the race, and then we'll share some stories about what it's like to do the race. First, we're going to start by telling you why we're wearing some of the garb that we're wearing. I'm wearing an outfit that you might see on the island after the race. So everybody has their crew shirts, we might race in a different version of this crew shirt, an SPF, sun protective, dry, uh, wick, you know, wicking dry shirt. And then we'll get dressed up on the island to go to dinner, but still in the crew shirt like any other sports team. Uh, I'm wearing a fairly traditional uh, yacht club blazer. Uh, Women don't wear these anywhere near as often as the men do, but uh, for, for things like the awards dinners, um, uh, the more formal events at the Yacht Club, it's very typical to see these. And some of us just wear whatever came out of the closet today. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk about the flags, Jan? Oh, of course. Thank you. Um, you may have been wondering about the flags uh, hanging uh, in the entrance hall. and. Um, uh, there is a reason they are called brag flags. Um, you are only, those are not participation awards. Um, you only win those uh, if you finish at the very top of your section, um, generally for second or third place. Um, the, the, we're going to talk about how there are different sections uh, of the race uh, as we go along here a little bit further, but um, uh, if each group um, of similar boats uh, race against each other, and then they race against everybody else, and that's how you end up with flags. So, to, we're going to talk a little bit about the history now, and to fully understand the MAC, you have to go back a few years to uh, 1886, with the design of two sloops um, by a guy out of Racine. And uh, these two sloops were the talk of the town, literally, uh, back in the day, everybody was interested in sailboat racing. It wasn't just a little topic once in a while. It was speculated on in the, in the press. There was betting on sailboat racing. And the two uh, big boats um, in Chicago were Banana and Siren. Um, so Siren was 59 feet and Banana was 64 feet. Um, this is a picture of Banana. Sadly, we don't have a picture of Siren from far away. But um, she was really quite a spectacular yacht. I think that the reason that everybody just jumped on talking about sailboat racing was because the state of affairs in Chicago in 1886 was really quite something. We're talking not very long after the Chicago fire, a few years before the opening ceremony of the Columbian Exposition, and the city really was looking for something fun to talk about it. So um, the amount of wagering on the, all the races, there weren't all that many, but all the races out of, in Lake Michigan really was astonishing. Multiple articles a day in the newspapers. So everybody was talking about this. Um, racing actually officially began 10 years later in 1896. And over that year and the next year, um, there were several races that pitted Venena and Siren against each other. Um, in addition to the wagering and the articles in the newspaper, the two owners uh, really uh, did a lot of um, uh, bragging about their boats. And so it, they were 
guys with big presences in the city, and uh, they really like to drum up the interest in the sailboat races. Uh, what was often interesting, though, is because they didn't have powerboats out watching the races, uh, somehow the finishes of who, which boat would win were really um, sort of inconclusive. Whether fog obscured the finish, or one guy said, uh uh, I won, and the other guy said, no, I won. Little unknown, but there was really nothing conclusive. And so in 1898, the Yacht Club sponsored a series of three races on the lake, specifically designed to garner interest and garner press and pitted <coughs> Banana and Siren against each other in those three races. They were three different weekends over June in 1898. And the two owners boasted to the press like you cannot believe. You read the articles and it's hilarious, it's so funny. Banana won, by the way, in those three races. The interesting outcome of those three races, though, is that people um, at Chicago Yacht got to thinking, huh, people seem to like talking about this sailboat racing. And that upstart club in New York, the New York Yacht Club, was already hosting a big distance race that everybody was talking about. And Chicago was not about to be outdone, so they had to think up, where should we do? We need a distance race. Where should we go? It just so happens that a lot of people were summering up on Mackinac Island. And so Mackinac Race was born as a bar bet. Basically, the first race uh, was two guys, three guys standing at the bar saying, you going up to the island? Race ya. So that's what happened. That's how the race started. Um, so what they really wanted to do and what they promoted at the time was the interest in figuring out what course you take for a race that is 333 miles long on a body of water that is 90 miles wide. So the first race was organized uh, for August of 1898, and we use the term organized loosely. Um, really, a gentleman's bet that started the race. Um, there was a lot of excitement among the sailors to see Siren and Banana dance with each other across the Great Lakes. After 52 hours, 17 minutes, and 50 seconds, Banana claims her place in history as the first winner of the race to Mackinac. And Siren placed a second 37 minutes and 20 seconds behind her nemesis, beating the schooner Hawthorne by 45 minutes. Mm. And many of us have been involved in close finishes, a lot, lot closer than 37 minutes. Yeah, it's hard. I have actually tied. I tied for second place. How do you race 333 miles in a tie? <laughs> we did rock, paper, scissors in the bar. We won. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so fast forward eight years, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, our members probably were standing around in the bar again and had a uh, want to race kind of moment. <laughs> Uh, and uh, because of the interest, uh, there was there was thinking that this would become something that would be uh, more regular. So it started being thought of as something they would would, would be done on an annual basis. So the first quote unquote annual race uh, would have been in 1904. There were uh, ten boats in all a mixture of different kinds of boats, sloops, yawls, and schooners. Sloops are what you think of as most of the sailboats you see today with one mast, and uh, yawls and schooners have two masts. You'll notice uh, on the results that are up on the screen behind me that even back in 1904, there was a, a time correction applied to the finish results. You can see elapsed time and corrected time. And um, that's really important for boats that are a little bit different uh, to race against one another. Um, there, there have been all kinds of handicap systems uh, over, over the years, and uh, we were joking earlier today about what constitutes a better system. Um, and of course, many of us would say the one that makes it easier for us to win. But in fact, the, 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 uh, the answer to that question is really, um, what makes the results the tightest? 
Um, and, and that's the basis that the MAC committee has used in evaluating different kinds of racing rules. So it might be surprising that the first all-female crew in the MAC was not in modern times. It was in 1905. Um, it was Miss Evelyn Wright. She had an all-women crew of four. Uh, the newspaper descriptions of her are cute and fun. Uh, her slender little figure is strong and supple, and her hands are calloused and hard as any jack tars. It goes on from there. You gotta love it. Um, in 1905, on that race, the weather started out fierce, heavy winds from the north. The Lady Eileen uh, had difficulty and foundered. There was another boat called the Raven that was already put in at South Haven, and they, I don't know how, but they heard that the eight Lady Eileen was in trouble, so they headed back out and uh, found all of the women sitting atop their boat, which was sinking. So they towed the Lady Eileen into South Haven and bailed, everybody bailed her out, and they took off again the next day, Raven and Lady Eileen. Um, interestingly, I guess it was commonplace in the early days to put into harbor on your way up the lake. And uh, the Lady Eileen actually took two weeks to finish, but finish she did, my gosh. <laughs> and uh, it was, I just, you know, it's great. So on the island, there was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he expressed his shock at seeing the girls clad in regulation oil skins, which are intended only for men. <laughs> So, so tomorrow night, the Chicago Yacht Club will do a send-off for our own female Olympians. Uh, Maggie Shea and Stephanie Robel are competing in Tokyo, and I had the privilege of sailing with Maggie uh, a number of years ago, and she's navigating um, up in Harbor Springs for the Yugata Regatta. And Yugata Regatta, they, they really like to send you around an interesting course, and the winds are very shifty. It's in um, Little Traverse Bay. So Maggie's doing her very best, and she's doing a great job. However, the men on the crew were not so kind to her, and they had poor Maggie in, in tears over you know, her navigating skills, and I am just incredibly proud of her because now she's an Olympian, and she's gonna go win a medal. <laughs> what class are they race in the Olympics? The 49ers. 49ers, thank you. Yeah, so out on the trapeze, it's pretty cool to watch. They're, they are two impressive women. Things happened rapidly in the ensuing years. In 1906, a grand trophy was purchased and adopted as the perpetual trophy for the race. This is the beautiful Mackinac Cup. The Mackinac Cup was purchased in 1906 by subscription among residents of Mackinac Island and yachtsmen organized by Eugene Sullivan, Ernest Potkammer, um, and Dr. W. L. Baum, who you will hear about a lot in a minute. Um, it was more than $1,500 $1, dollars worth of silver was used in fashioning the design. On April 23rd, 1906, an article in the Trib, there's the headline, Magnet Cup Wealth is Welcomed, and recounted that yachtsmen and prominent summer, summer residents of Magnet are competing, plan, are completing plans for fundraising for a magnificent $1,000 cup to be hung as a perpetual challenge emblem for the Mackinac crews of the Chicago Yacht Club. The sum of money is nearly completed and silversmiths are preparing designs suitable for the purpose to submit to the committee. Chicago Yacht Club officials and members are enthusiastic over the announcement and should, and should the Northern Yachtsmen fall fail to raise sufficient funds, no doubt um, it's felt that local yachtsmen will come to their assistance. That's probably enough. That's the trophy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's always uh -huh. about the trophy. It was a big deal. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is this where I get to talk about filling the trophy? No, that's the no, right. No, right. Right. <laughs> get better story. Uh -huh. So there are more notable events in earlier years. Um, one of the things that's kind of fun, in 1916, Hugh Fullerton, uh, wrote a ship's log that was syndicated to 500 newspapers. So, I mean, there was so much interest in this race. Um, the race was canceled uh, before, in uh, 1917 through 20, for World War I. So the boats were conscripted and the men were gone. 
The boats were out working for the Navy. Um, I looked when we went under lockdown for COVID, I looked to see if the Spanish flu had anything to do with us stopping the race in those years. There was no mention of the Spanish flu whatsoever. It only talks about World War I being the cause of that. Um, Jan. So as we uh, move forward, um, it, it's hard for uh, sailors today to even imagine doing a race without the bridge being there. But uh, the Mackinac Bridge wasn't built until 1957. And of course, that is um, one of the landmarks of, of the race. Um, uh, the uh, first um, uh, invention of the uh, Island Goat Sailing Society was in 1959. Uh, the Island Goats, uh, you have to have um, participated in at least 25 of the races to Mackinac, and all three of us um, have done that. Uh, the, the first um, uh, woman goat was Ann Jewell, and her son and grandsons are still out sailing against us uh, to this day. Uh, the boat that I race on uh, has three generations of the same family sailing together. Um, not mine, but um, I've been adopted into the family. Uh, I'm part of the sailing family. Um, one of the reasons that the race has exploded is that um, with the advent of fiberglass boats, the maintenance of boats is so much easier than it used to be, uh, and it became far more accessible to many, many people. MAC race is now larger than any other annual offshore race worldwide. And it's the, it's the longest, freshwater. oldest running freshwater race in the world. Um, and it's a, it's a bucket list item for many, many people. Sailors come from all over the world to do the race. Um, and they are sometimes awed by Lake Michigan, <laughs> as we all have been. Um, I think there's, there's a famous uh, story about Ted Turner doing the race in the 70s, and he was referring to Lake Michigan as a mill pond, and um, he was shamed. <laughs> <laughs> Said he'd never come back to Lake Michigan again. <laughs> what are so. the qualifications to enter? It says by invitation only. So what do you need to qualify? Um, essentially, uh, it's invitation to ensure that you can uh, safely right. participate in the race. So what's required is that the boat um, meets certain stability standards, um, that the person in charge, I mean this, usually the skipper, um, has enough experience um, uh, so, that, that, so that the organizing authority can feel pretty comfortable that it's possible to be safe doing it. Again, there are people who think it's a lake. Now, it's really an inland ocean. So let's switch gears and talk about some prep for the race. Um, as we start out, we of course try to anticipate what the conditions are going to be, but you have to be ready for everything. And we just had to show this slide because of the similarities. The black and white photo is um, about 1900, and that is the crew of Banana, Becalmed. And the similarity with my crew in 2016, Becalmed, was just too funny. Everybody in the back of the boat sort of thinking, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Other years, it's a, a battle against nature. Um, the, 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 the storms are legendary. Um, uh, in 1911, uh, there were 80 mile an hour winds, um, and uh, there, were, there was a, a, a very famous wreck called the Vincicor that um, uh, caused uh, Grace Reef to become uh, a mark of the course to avoid a shallow spot that people used to just try and cut across. Um, Amarita uh, the, uh, established the, the um, fastest race, and that record stood until 1987 when Pied Piper broke that record with a time of 25 hours and 50 minutes. I see a gentleman here wearing a Pied Piper jacket. Um, you might recognize the picture behind here because Pied Piper is in it uh, from uh, 1995. Uh, but um, 1937 was another um, uh, legendary year. 
Uh, we've already talked about 1970. Um, this picture uh, behind me was it was something, uh, Nancy and I did that race together that was taken from our boat at about five o'clock in the afternoon facing west. 2002 um, was another impressive storm. Um, that that storm caused a uh, trimaran, trimaran. trimaran uh -huh. Caliente to flip um, very close to uh, the Mackinac Bridge maybe within five, six miles of the bridge, so very close to the finish line. Um, I was racing um, a Santa Cruz 70, and we were all milling around. The wind had died, and there we were, just all together, waiting for the wind to pick up, kind of switching positions around, and Nightmare, which was another 70, had been two hours behind the rest of us. We had, we had them in, in the bag, right? They were gone. Well, they brought the wind up with them um, and won the race, <laughs> which was not making any of the rest of us happy. And that's one of those finishes where we finished in driving rain. The two bowmen were on the bow trying to call who crossed the line first. They're still arguing to this day. Um, but the, uh, the storm was enough to cause the safety regulations for the race to be changed. Um, it tightened up considerably. So over the years, as there have been incidents, we've seen the safety regulations change um, significantly. And so I think the next storm year was 2018. Yeah, yeah, why don't we just show the storm from 2011 real fast. Ah, finance. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh. So this is a storm from 2011, a video shot by my friend Greg Alm aboard Reina Alta. And it looks like it was during the day, but that's just lightning. We were all out there. We were all out here for this storm. start going sideways, it's when you have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> they have no stability to go that direction. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, Angela was saying uh, uh, some of those storms have real, uh, uh, turned into um, improvements in our safety requirements. Uh, the, the boat that flipped resulted in our increasing um, uh, the requirements for personal flotation. Uh, the storm in 2011 um, uh, resulted in all of us having to carry one-handed knives. Um, you have to be able to open them with one hand. And so we're, they're constantly um, evolving. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but I am going to tell you that this is only one page of 19 pages of safety wow. requirements. A very good question, actually. It, that's so that if you can only free up one hand, you're holding on to the boat or something, and you have to cut yourself loose in particular, you know, if you're harnessed in or you're caught up in the rigging, you'd be able to open your knife without having two hands. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we practice it. We, we're kind of cool with our knives, right? <laughs> But uh, the, the 19 pages relate to um, individual responsibility for, for making sure that the equipment on your boat works, the kind of boat attributes, uh, the kind of equipment you need to carry, and all the safety equipment you have to carry. And, and we're inspected um, very often when we get to the island, especially um, section winners or boats that are the first to compete. Um, so the race committee comes on board to make sure that 
we had the proper equipment, and that yes, we can indeed open our knives with one hand. They consistently test us for that. Mm -hmm. They do. And we do carry a lot of the old-fashioned equipment because it can still save lives. This whistle has saved many lives. People have been rescued by it. Cover your ears, I'm gonna blow this. And I wasn't even blowing that in panic and hard. And there have been sailors rescued just because of this. It's all the people here and they can find them with this. We carry paper charts, we carry bells, we carry the knives. These are all important things. That hasn't changed for the race. That hasn't changed. Things like this are still important. I think we'll just... Oh, flashlights. Yeah. Let's talk about okay. flashlights. That's a yeah. modern invention. Uh -huh. <laughs> flashlights have changed the way we get to race. We use flashlights above decks to look at the sails. And we use flashlights below decks. We all have a white light on all night long so that when you run below deck or even when you have to see a line, you can quickly light it up and see what you need to do real fast. And we call it a white light because you can use both hands if you hold it, if you hold it in your teeth. And some of us use these. Um, you see the little button on the red hat over there. That's one of the hats that I use all the time. And um, I can just wear it like a headlamp and hit that button, and I've got uh, either a red or a white light. And I always lose my lights during the race, so I carry right. about six of them with me because I'm forever. I, I put them away when I get up in the morning, and then where do they go? That's why I wear mine around my yeah, neck. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Was that one too? <laughs> so let's talk about weather. Weather. Very important aspect. Uh, mm. So the, the checking of weather starts now, now. or even earlier. Um, so Jan was mm -hmm. talking about how she's already checked out the weather um, for next weekend. We have incredibly sophisticated weather now. But it used to be they had a system called May 4, which is the marine forecast. Um, and the, the way they, that it worked is it broadcast a few times a day, three times a day? Three. Mm -hmm. Three times a day. And the, they issued numbers, and then you had to look in your chart to figure out what those numbers meant, interpret them, and then tell the crew what the weather was. Now, we just, we see the weather up on our laptops, you know, down below. The navigator mm -hmm. is talking to us all the time about the ships that are coming in, where the weather system, you know, is, what's, what it's likely to do. Mm -hmm. um, one of the entertaining things pre-race is when everybody's speculating what's going to happen. Everybody's got a little bit different idea, so they decide which mm -hmm. side of the lake they're going to favor as they go up there. So we start looking at charts like this one, um, uh, early on, we're, we're going to be basically be starting now. Uh, you all know that you can't possibly know what the weather's going to be like 10 days from now yet. But um, we, we'd like to uh, watch to see how things are, are developing and how the models are developing. And then we start developing plans for our boats. Um, here is a, a, a wind modeling chart um, showing really strong breeze on Lake Erie, and we'll watch, we will watch. What, what, the, what the wind patterns are as we go forward through all of this. Um, uh, there are very sophisticated um, uh, charts available uh, for you, for your individual boat. And you can see on this chart, um, the line that is closest um, to Michigan is the shortest route. But um, you, don't, you see one here labeled optimal route, and that's for that specific type of boat based on how fast it will go and where it will be at the time that winds change. Every boat's chart is going to look a little bit different. Um, in this case, there's an expectation of a wind shift, and that's why you would change course at the point that that happens. And, of course, we would all love to know this, um, that we're going to actually finish at a specific time on Sunday. Um, uh, the only thing you know absolutely is that this is going to be wrong. You just don't know by how much and in which right. direction. And I also think that some of this weather modeling takes a bit of the romance out of the race, but you have to do it now to compete. And it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting lesson to go through and then track all the changes that happen. Mm -hmm. Now, there used to be a 
dinner on Friday night, at which there would be a weather forecast given. Um, things haven't changed in terms of Friday night briefings. We do get a weather forecast, but now it's given by a marine, professional marine forecaster. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, it used to be Harry Volkman from Channel 5. <laughs> that was as good as it got, you know? So it's gotten much more sophisticated now. Um, the pre-race party is always fun, it's a tradition. It has changed a lot. Um, it used to be a men-only affair. That's when they would get the weather briefing, but wives weren't allowed. There were other women there, but not your wife. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I have a good friend, Cindy Sargent, who sailed the race in the 60s and the 70s. And Cindy said she got so mad at the fact that she was a crew on a boat, and she couldn't go to the dinner, that she held her own dinner at Columbia Yacht Club for the three women on the race in, this, in 1966. So I also have to add to that a funny story. I was sitting at the bar um, at the Yacht Club, and like so many wonderful clubs, you know, the nice thing about it is people of all ages get together and get to chatting, and I'm at the bar with a guy who's 85 and one who's about 64, and then a couple of 30-year-olds, and I told Cindy's story, and the 85-year-old was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's how it used to be. The 64-year-old said, I remember hearing stories about that. Happily, the two 30-year-old millennials were like, wait, what? So I was really happy that they didn't know that and didn't understand the concept. So let's talk about meal planning. Let's talk about food. Um, so meal planning has probably changed a lot over the years. Um, even in the years that we've been sailing the race, um, very different. So I, I did races where we used to bring the, um, the beef tenderloin and the garlic mashed potatoes and the Caesar salad and everybody sat down at the table and ate dinner. Um, those days are gone um, for most of us. I think there's still some boats out there. I hear stories about you know bringing the wine along and I dream of boats like that. Um, we are having sandwiches. Um, and the preparation for that uh, it involves healthy health nutrition, you know, as you would expect. What do you need to get through the race? Um, and reduce weight. You don't want, you know, to take a lot of bulky food with you. You have to keep it cold. Some boats have refrigeration. Um, some boats are just using coolers and ice. Um, that's certainly something that's changed. It used to be any um, any refrigeration on boats, but blocks of ice, dry ice, coolers, um, those were kind of the norm back in the day. Um, but I still think they ate better. We, we eat well, you know, protein bars and sandwiches and things like that. Um, focus on nutrition. Um, we used to do gourmet picnic food. <laughs> I would do a smoked pork tenderloin and green beans, but it was all pre-packaged, ready to hand up to crew to eat whenever they wanted to. Uh, so water has changed in that uh, we try and minimize the numbers of plastic bottles that we're bringing with us. Um, I've been on boats where they do your personal water bottle um, with you know some jugs of water, but then also a filtration system so that you can use the water out of the lake. Um, I think we're all trying to minimize the amount of garbage that we create out there. We're very conscious about protecting the lake um, and at the same time making sure that everybody stays hydrated because. I don't want anybody getting dehydrated on the race. Mm -hmm. The gear has changed uh, enormously over the years. Um, we're long past the days of heavy cotton impregnated with tar or other kind of petroleum products, which enhance the name oil skins. Um, uh, just in the, in the years that uh, the three of us have been sailing, um, the, the gear has changed a lot. I brought some of my own gear. Nancy's going to show you some of hers. She's going to put some on. But um, I've got a bunch of the gear I'm taking with me in a week over here. But one thing I'm not taking with me is this foam life jacket sitting down here on the ground. I have an inflatable life jacket, sort of like the ones they advertise on airplanes, uh, that um, has a strobe light and a whistle. Uh, inside of it, uh, and it will automatically inflate if I go in the water. Uh, 
I have, I don't wear boots anymore. I have waterproof socks, a great invention. Um, it's, it, it, it just makes life much easier. It, and it doesn't take up as much volume on the boat either. So all of this is good. Um, now, Nan, you can see it's taking Nancy a while to put all of this stuff on. But you know what? It takes a whole lot longer when, the, when you're doing this down below in the dark on a pitching boat. And half the time, half the time you end up sleeping in this gear. Um, because this is just too much bother. Yeah. How hot would that be in a 90 degree weather? What you got on? It's, it's excruciatingly hot. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons you take an awful lot of uh, water with you. Um, I actually have a cooling towel that if you cool that and put it around your neck, it does help keep you cool. Um, but um, most of the time, if it's, if it's 90 degrees, you're also not neat. It's going to be out for that long wearing this, all of that. And this is the classic move. Can you pull my hood out? Yeah. <laughs> there, we go. there you go. That's uh, always a given. Yes. And you'll notice, you'll notice that, and that's safe, safety yellow for a reason, because if you go overboard, you want people to be able to see that uh, clearly. Um, what Nancy's holding in her hand is a tether that gets attached to the boat, so that if you're if you're working hard on a lumpy boat, we we install things called jack lines, which are essentially think uh, safety handrails that are made out of a heavy duty netting that run from stem to stern on the boat, so that you can hook onto that thing and move around. And if you fall down, you're probably not falling off the boat, and it'd be much easier to get you back. And if you do fall off the boat, yes, you could be dragged, and that's part of the reason why we carry our one-handed knives, so that yeah. if necessary, we can cut ourselves loose. Yeah. But hopefully somebody will pick you up before that is necessary. So yeah. this, this knife would be on my presence at all time. It would be wrapped around my waist and ready to pull out. Um, this device, if I go in the water, it automatically inflates, and there's another whistle, there's a light that comes up, and... Mm -hmm. There's an AIS beacon in it. Yeah. So it's got everything here, you're attached. Mm -hmm. And we go through drills every year on how to stay safe if you do go overboard in the water, the position that you should take right away when you go over so you can try to stay warm, mm -hmm. the kinds of things you need to do. You need to find your whistle. Mm -hmm. If this doesn't inflate by itself, there's a manual inflating, inflating tube. So there's a, lot, mm -hmm. there's a lot packed in this little gizmo. Yeah. And how recent is that little gizmo? This I just bought last year. This is new. And we have to uh, make sure that the canisters are charged all the time. So we always go through every year. We will all check our own harnesses, and we're responsible for everything in this working correctly. So we'll replace the air canisters, because you want to make sure this goes off when you hit the water. Now I'm going to take all of it off. Yes, you are. <laughs> So all of this is, is, is uh, far improved from uh, what we all wore the first two times that we went out. Shall we? Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to switch to the races within the race. Yeah. So there's, there's really three races that we can say. So there's the race to Betsy. There's the race from Betsy to the bridge, and there's the race from the bridge to the finish line. And for those of you who don't know what Point Betsy is, it's near Frankfurt, Michigan. Oh. So it's that's sort of a straight line uh, diagonally up the lake to the other side. So when we see Betsy, we know we're getting close. Um, and it's you can you can win the two first races, but it doesn't matter unless you win the, the last one. And mm -hmm. as I said, you know, you can think you've put some boat two hours behind you, then the wind dies right at the bridge. It's all the time. Yep. And you're drifting around, and that boat you put behind, there they are again. Um, I've drifted across the finish line sideways. <laughs> mm -hmm. How many miles is Betsy? Over 200? Um, it, it's uh, about 190. Oh, okay. And then the, ne the next section is the one that always makes me crazy because it doesn't seem like it's more than 100 miles, but it's 100 miles. 
uh, the next section, and then you get to Gray's Reef uh, and turn into the Straits. How long is that leg? The last the third one. The third leg uh, is uh, a little over 25 miles to the bridge, and then another five miles to the finish. Is 333 is a crow flies or uh, statues? Statue miles. Statue miles. Statue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the wrong line. So the 190, the 100, and the is that and another over 333? Mm-hmm. That's about right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Thank yeah. You. But we we said a lot more miles than that. <laughs> That's if you go oh. straight, right? Yeah. But we don't. Yeah. Many times the right. the wind will be over on the Wisconsin shore. Yeah. So you're hugging the Wisconsin shore all the way up, and then uh -huh. you you make the big cut across. Sometimes mm -hmm. you get up into the Manitou Islands, and rarely, but it happens. You think going outside the Manitous is the way to go because there's supposed to be more wind out there. Well, that's that's more mileage to go that direction. Mm -hmm. But it's paid off, you know, yeah. so you're always watching where the wind's going to be and where you're mm -hmm. where you're going to be ahead of your competitors because it's it's not just where you think the wind is, but you have to put yourself mm -hmm. between your competitors yeah. and the finish line. Yeah. And we're just so, watching our time so we might zip through a couple of the slides okay. here. Mm -hmm. you, you lead. Uh -huh. <laughs> So anyhow, this is a picture of where we start, and we start in, in, in batches of, of anywhere between uh, 15 to 30 boats based on boats that are sim either completely identical or similar enough that, um, that uh, they're going to be racing and taking about the same amount of time to get there. We used to have to call in by radio at the 45th parallel, which is basically at Leland, and the way that you knew that you were at the 45th parallel to, to call in was to use your latitude, longitude finding you to find out where you were. And then you would plot it on this grid and you would call in and tell two folks that were sitting in a car on the bluff at Leland listening to the radio which grid you were in. And that's how they would know where the fleet was on the lake and that's how they would track us up the lake. We and, also, oh, and people lied a lot. People lied a lot. <laughs> and you would, you would be right next to a boat that would be calling in a whole square ahead of you. And you're or like, two you squares behind. You, you are not. That's, well, you're right here. You're right here. <laughs> uh, we used to search constantly with binoculars because you never knew where anybody was. You would spend hours uh, just sitting on the rail, searching the water with binoculars to see where your competitors were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we went from the grid, where people could easily lie, to spotters at the 45th parallel, where yeah. there were actually people who knew where you were, um, and that got a little more sophisticated. And now we're... And now this now is the track. Use, now we use the race tracker. Mm -hmm. We can, when we are in cell phone range, we can see where our competitors are. Um, and the race committee can see where everybody is. So. So this is, is more about the weather. That, that storm that you see there was um, 2011, when we saw the video earlier. Um, it was the most incredible lightning I've ever seen. It, the, the lightning went on for hours, and it was everywhere. And you knew the storm was coming, you knew the storm was coming, and, and then it hit. <laughs> Imagine only having May 4 to listen to. You, wouldn't, you would see it coming. We saw it coming, because you could see the lightning. But back in the day, when they only had May 4, and back in, even when we started the race, all you had was the weather radio, which, by the way, called that storm completely wrong. Mm -hmm. you, I was listening to it today. The weather NOAA was saying that storm was having maximum winds of 35 knots. We had 80 and 100 knots. Mm -hmm. Oops. Arrow. This one. Is that yeah, one? there we go. Yeah. So um, we, you've, you've seen uh, some of the forecasting tools, but we still have to navigate our way up there. And um, uh, it's a whole lot better with, um, with the tools we have now. We all uh, use uh, Garmin navigation. Um, uh, and so you can find your way up there with this. <laughs> um, Somebody's always navigating, uh, and other folks are sailing the boat, and we don't stop. Um, it's uh, a 24-7 situation. Uh, we all divide up our, 
uh, our teams uh, into watches. There are lots of different uh, um, methods that we use. Our boat divides the crew into three watches. Two are on deck at all times. So there's never a uh, one watch on, one watch off. There's always some transition uh, with um, uh, trading off. Um, the part of the boat, um, somebody's always paying attention to navigating. Others are trimming the sails. Others are watching the weather. Um, others are watching the boats around us. Um, and you're constantly doing things. Um, you never stop trying to get that last little ooch of speed out of the boat. Um, we're out there to win, and we are pushing it every single minute. Um, I believe the race is won on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Monday morning, for those who didn't pay attention on Saturday night, and now that the team is too tired, too malnourished, um, too frustrated with each other because they hadn't prepared well enough, um, and um, uh, those just little adjustments that you make all the way along along uh, on the race are the difference between a podium finish and frustration. Is there a fixed number of crew for a given class? Good or question. Is there a minimum, a minimum and a max? For well, there is a minimum for safety reasons, mm -hmm. but, um, and I think it's, well, we have a double-handed section still, but I think it might be three for the smallest boats. But Other than the double-handed max? Yeah. There is a double-handed max. Yeah. But um, for, for the most part, the, 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 the crew limitations, if you sail in a one design section, they have specific rules as to the number of people um, that you're it's allowed. Weight, it's weight limit. It, and it's, it's weight. weight limit mm -hmm. for your crew. Yeah. So while other people are above sailing, somebody's down below trying to sleep. And if you can imagine, somebody's always grinding a winch. There's always noise. There's sail changes. The boat is tilting one way or the other. You're often awakened if you are happen to be sleeping and told to get up on the other side of the boat because they need to move your weight somewhere else. And, you know, back in the day when it was paper charts, there were red lights that you would use to see it to, to minimize night blindness. But now, you've got two, three, four computers down there. And you know what they say about not watching TV and not looking at your screen at night, all that blue light? It's so bright down below the boat, on the boats these days with all the computers, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. But you still have to try to get some rest because rest is very important. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about eating. Um, on our boat, we don't have no times. We just grab and go when we're off watch. Um, we eat well once we get to the island. <laughs> yeah, we, we just like to hand food up whenever anybody wants it. We try to keep a lot of things like hard boiled eggs and string cheese. We do have meals prepackaged. People can eat whenever they want. But one of the joys of the Mac is eating a Snickers bar at midnight. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. You gotta stay awake. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you never really know what you're going to see. Um, this this wasn't um, my adventure, but uh, on one race, uh, it's uh, late Sunday night. Um, we we're uh, flying a spinnaker around the Fox Islands, so we're up, we're not to Gray's Reef yet, but we're up in that patch far north, and. I'm, I'm standing in the middle of the boat, and I'm flying the spinnaker, and first I hear a thump, and a thump. It's a heron. Bigger than this picture, um, that ran, that, that was just minding his own business, flying up, across between, from the mainland to the island, and ran into our mainsail. <laughs> and then, well, down on the deck. Um, I was fairly annoyed at our crew who were busy trying to take pictures and giving me night blindness while I'm trying to fly the spinnaker. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he got pretty bored with us and, and took off. Um, and I turned to the guys and basically said, you know, he's still here. I said, what are you talking about? He said, look up. At the top of the mast, that bird sat there for another few minutes before taking off again. <laughs> So you never really know. You never know. And I once, on a Sunday morning, going by Beaver Island, I realized I'm driving a boat, and I had my whole crew was staring at me. I was like, what? Nothing. <laughs> what, do you, what are you staring at me for? Nothing but don't move. What do you mean, don't move? And, I, and they're like, no, no, no. There's a bat sitting on your ponytail. <laughs> I had a bat perched right back here sitting on my ponytail. That was a freak out moment. Oh. So, 
one of the excerpts out there is when we're in the shipping lanes, especially when you get into the, the northern part of the lake. That's the badger. That's the badger. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that the this is a lot of said, right? Yes. Badger from Ludington. Yeah. Yeah, yeah from right. to yeah. Ludington. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, the, but there's there's a, lots of freights, freighters that go through. Um, and when it comes to a freighter, you don't have the right of way. As a sailboat, you might think you have the right of way, but you want to be out of the way of those so that the Coast Guard does advise the freighters to stay away from the fleet. Um, and they try and let people know kind of where the fleet is on the lake and they advise, you know, freighters as they're going through to go someplace else because the freighters don't want to see us either. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are hazards out there, like um, there have been a couple of inst instances where they've lost entire shiploads of logs into the lake and so now the logs are floating just below the surface and, you know, even if even if you're going very slowly, you do not want to hit one of those logs in your boat. You're going to do some damage. So um, we're always keeping an eye out to see what's going on out there, monitoring the radio traffic, um, keeping and and the Coast Guard keeps an eye on us too. The uh, Mackinac Cutter Mackinac follows the fleet yeah. up to the mm -hmm. island to, to make sure that we get there safe. And we do have AIS on most boats have AIS on board, so we can track the ships. I have AIS on my phone. When I'm in cell phone range, I can pull it up and track the ships mm -hmm. and other boats that have AIS. So that's a help. Mm -hmm. So while we're out there racing, there's a nice party going on at the Grand Hotel. Mm -hmm. It used to be called the Ladies' Party. It was very formal. It was with hats and uh, had to have the proper attire. Now it's called the Porch Party. Uh, men can go because there are plenty of spouses of women sailing on the race that go. Also, boats that get in early enough it has happened. Um, this party is on Sunday afternoon, but any boat that gets in early enough is welcome to go as well. It is a big deal. It's usually a sold out affair. Everybody loves to go to it. It's a lot of fun. And maybe someday one of us will actually go to it. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I don't know. My crew looked at me when I suggested that and said, you, you would hate watching all the boats sail. <laughs> I might. I might. So communicating the race, as I said earlier, used to be done by telegraph and by ship's logs getting tr transmitted to other uh, newspapers and by newspaper reports. These days, pretty much everything happens by the race tracker on social media. Um, definitely easy to follow the race and easy for people to follow along. My friend Cindy Sargent had an article written about her um, in the 60s, and it wasn't in the sports section, it was in the women's fashion section. That's where it went. And that happened just recently, too. You know, the article written about you. Yeah. Um, there was an article in the Tribune a couple of weeks ago, and I think it was the retirement section because they were talking about um, uh, the goats and those who had done many races, but um, one of the uh, owners of the boat Jan sails on um, Sean O'Neill and myself were interviewed. Um, but again, not in the sports section. Not in the sports <laughs> section. Uh, we're always very happy when we finally see this. Uh, when you make the turn at Gray's Reef, 25 miles away, you can just make out these fans. Um, so you, you've now got a beacon for, for the next uh, stretch of the race. Uh, and you feel like when you get to the bridge, you're there. But you've still got another five miles to go, and an awful lot of stuff can and has happened between uh, yeah. those two places. Lots of times the doldrums hit and you might be ahead as we've talked about and you just sit for hours. Mm -hmm. So finally we get to Mackinac Island and it used to be that it was a first come first serve um, when we got to the island and then they tried to figure out where to put all the boats which was pretty much of a free for all. Um, a lot of jockeying for position. Now they figure it all out ahead of time. Especially this year, because the uh, Michigan DNR is not allowing boats to wrap up against each other, so we won't look like that. Um, they're they're allowing about half the fleet on the island. Oh, no, not, any, no, not even a third. About a third. Um, and then other boats over in Magma City, other boats in Saint Ignace. Um, so they're getting as many boats onto the island as possible, but it's it's going to be different. Um, and, and we will miss that, that big party in the raft. 
but the organization that they've put into it now is much improved because you know where you're going when you finish the race. You don't spend, it was backed up for five hours at times mm -hmm. where you finished the race and you were just waiting for them to tell you where you could put your boat. Um, which is, and, and then they, they tell you you're being inspected as well. I think you're never going to get to the pink pony. This, by the way, is a picture of the actual finish line of the race. Um, in the foreground, you can see um, a, a big red cone that's on the shore. Um, and you see the, the Round Island Lighthouse. And the line between those two is the actual finish line of the race. And one of the things that has changed is we don't have to dry our sails out anymore, generally. Generally, everybody's just drying their gear out if we've been in the rain. But it used to be that the sails had to be hauled off the boat because they were made of material that had to be dried. You couldn't put them away wet. The, um, uh, the parties and uh, awards for the sailors on the island have gone uh, far more uh, casual. Uh, there used to be just a simple flag presentation for the winners. Now that you see the sailor celebration is um, uh, a big celebration for everyone who's participated in the race with plenty of free-flowing um, adult beverages and food and music, followed by an award ceremony. Yeah. Now I get to talk about the cup. Um, so that you can see there how beautiful these um, trophies are. If you get a chance to come down to Chicago, yeah, but they're on display all the time. And you can come in and take a look at them. Um, they're, you can't put a price tag on them because they're irreplaceable at this point. But they like, they like, sailors like to win them for two reasons, because they like to win, obviously. Um, but if you win, they fill the cup with um, the drink of choice. Very frequently champagne, but uh, I've known it to be stingers or a variety of other alcohol. And then everybody drinks out of the cup. The skipper yes. pays, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the lucky skipper. So, after all we told you, we, we didn't tell you about the biting flies, but oh yeah, there's biting flies out on our lake too. So after all we've told you, you might be wondering, why are you doing this for the 31st, the 30th, and the 34th time? We think this video sums it up really well. Oops. Oops. Back here. I thought I had that right. Let's see if we can find it. Oh my goodness. It begins in a familiar setting, yet opens to a world of its own. The longest freshwater sailing race in the world marks the turning point of Chicago's sailing season. It's a big deal, and it happens every year. More than 300 sailboats, nearly 3,000 sailors, compete in this world-class event. The race has grown and evolved, but is essentially the same race as the first one. That was July 1898, when just five boats pointed themselves north and sped to that distant and historic island. Lake Michigan is the arena, and upon this ever-changing stage, a thousand dramas and comedies unfold in a test of skill, teamwork, and endurance. The competition is fierce, yet beyond the flags and trophies, the rum drinks and lawn parties, the Mac race's defining characteristic is relationships and reunion. It's about the oldest buddies, the newest best friends. The experience itself, to be offshore where wind meets water, can deepen your soul. Which is why the race is about stories and memories. It's about families and loves and boats handed down as legacies to sail on. The Chicago Yacht Club's race to Mackinac is a tribute, an annual ritual in honor of the sport and the great waters that define our landscape. Consider this your invitation. We hope that you will all join us virtually or in person to watch the Parade of Boats on Saturday, next Saturday the 17th at Navy Pier. It starts at 11 a.m. And um, you can watch us online. You can go to Chicago Yacht Club the Facebook page or our website and watch the boats on one of that tracker. Watch us go up the lake. Thank you. We really appreciate you letting us tell our stories tonight. Thank you.